Section 6 of Astounding Stories 18, June 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Fournier, Centerville, Virginia, USA. Chapter 7 Lord of the Jungle. Ape Man, never realizing that his actual strength was that of but a puny human being, was racing with Ellen Estabrook into the very midst of animals which would tear him to bits as easily as they would tear any human being to pieces. Ape Man, being but an ape after all, would merely think that he was joining his own kind, bearing with him a mate of white skin. But to the other apes, he would be a human being, a puny, hairless imitation of themselves, which they would pounce upon and tear asunder with great glee. Ape Man would not know this, would not realize his limitations. He would try to take to the upper terraces of the jungle, to swing from tree to tree, carrying his mate, and would find the body of Bentley incapable of supporting such an effort. Ape Man would be a child in the hands of his brethren, who could not know him. Ape Man would probably speak to them after a fashion, but his gibberish would come strangely, perhaps unintelligibly, through the mouth of Bentley. They would suspect him, and destroy him, and with him Ellen Estabrook, unless other apes discovered also her sex and took her, fighting over her among themselves. Bentley made good time across the jungle clearing. Behind him came the voice of Barter in final exhortation. Your human cunning, hampered by your simian body, pitted against the highly specialized body of your former self, in turn hampered by the lack of reasoning of an ape, in a contest in primitive surrounding for a female, a glorious experiment, and all depends now upon you. You will save the girl who loves you and whom you love, but you must return to me and be transferred before you can make your love known. I shall wait for you. In Bentley's brain, the shouted words of Barter rang as he hurried into the jungle in pursuit of Ape Man. Ellen Estabrook was crying, Hurry, Lee, hurry! Yet she was really yelling to Ape Man, the man-beast which carried her, bidding him race on to escape the pursuit of Man-Ape, in whom she would never recognize the man she loved. She must have thought that Bentley had taken a desperate chance to escape the clutches of Barter, and that Barter had set his trained ape to pursue them. What else could she think? How could she know that she was actually in the power of an ape, and that her loved one actually pursued to save her? With every desire of her body, she was urging Ape Man to take her away from Man Ape, but she must also have heard the challenges of the man-apes in the jungle ahead. She was looking back over Ape Man's shoulder, wondering, perhaps, if Barter would again come out to save them from the anthropoids. Bentley could guess at her thoughts as he raced on in pursuit of Ape Man. Would he be in time? Even if he were, Ape Man himself would turn against him. If he were to try to aid Ellen, she would fight against him, believing him an ape, and how could he fight? Would his brain be able to direct his mighty arms and his fighting fangs in a battle with the apes of the jungle? As he thought of coming to grips with the apes on equal terms, something never in this world before vouchsafed to a human being, he felt a fierce exultation upon him. He felt a desire to take part in mortal combat with them, to fight them fist and fang, and to destroy them one by one, he had their strength and more. He had the cunning of a human being to match against the dim wits of the apes. He had a chance. But he must protect not only Ellen, but Ape Man. Both Ellen and Ape Man would be against him. Ellen would fear him as an ape that desired her. Ape Man would fight him as a rival for the favors of a she. And he must harm neither. His own body which Ape Man directed, must be spared, must be kept alive, while every effort of Ape Man would be to force Bentley to slay. It was a predicament which, well, 
Only Caleb Barter had foreseen it. The bellowing of the apes was a continuous roar on all sides now. Bentley felt a fierce sensation of joy welling up within him, and he answered their bellowing with savage bellows of his own. His legs were obeying his will. His knuckles touched the ground as he raced on all fours. He could hear the shriek of Ellen there ahead, and knew that ape man and the girl were surrounded, that he must make all possible speed if he were to be in time. Ape man and his captive were on the trail, trapped there, just as ape man had started into the jungle. Ape man had lifted Ellen so that her hands might have grasped a limb, but the girl had refused to attempt to escape by the trees if her lover remained behind. She had crumpled to the ground, an ape man snarling, smashing his chest, which was so sickly white as compared to the chests of the other apes, had turned upon his brethren. They hesitated for a moment, as though amazed at the affrontery of this mere human. Then a man-ape charged. Ape-man met him with arms and fangs, and Bentley saw Ape-man's all-too-small mouth snap out for the vein in the neck of Ape-man's attacker. The ape whose brain reposed in Ape-man had been a courageous beast, that was plain, but he was fighting for his she, and he did not know his limitations. Ape-man was bowled over as though he had been a blade of grass, and the great ape was crouched over him, nuzzling at his white flesh when Bentley Man-Ape arrived. With a savage bellow and with a mighty lunge, Bentley leaped upon the attacker of Ape-man. His arms obeyed him with more certainty now, perhaps because the matter was so vitally urgent. Bentley's brain knew jujitsu, boxing, ways of rough-and-tumble fighting of which the great apes had never learned, nor ever would learn. He hurled himself upon the animal that was on the point of pulling ape-man apart as though he had indeed been a fly, and literally flattened him against the ground. His mighty hands searched for the throat of the great ape, while he instinctively pulled his stomach out of the way of possible disemboweling tactics on the part of his antagonist. But the great ape twisted from his grasp, struggled erect, and, amazed at what he was doing, surprised that he, Lee Bentley, could even conceive of such a thing, he launched his attack with bared and glistening fangs straight at the throat of his enemy. His mouth closed, his fangs ripped home, and the great ape whose throat he had torn away, whose blood was salt on his slavering lips, was tossed aside as an empty husk, to die convulsively, a dripping horror which was human-like in a ghastly fashion. Bentley felt like a murderer, not like a murderer either, but like a man who has slain unavoidably and hates himself for doing so. Ellen was backed against the tree into which Ape-Man had tried to force her. Ape-Man was up now, moving to stand beside her. Ape-Man had discovered that he was not the invincible creature he had thought himself. Bentley moved in closer to the two, as other apes charged upon him from both sides, smothering him, giving him no time. He was a stranger, seemingly, an upstart to be destroyed, and he was forced to fight them with all his ape strength and human cunning, while Ape Man, whimpering, caught up Ellen and darted away with her, straight into the jungle. For Bentley, this was a sort of respite. Ellen was not afraid to go with Ape Man, thinking him Bentley. The great apes were bent on destroying this strange ape which had come into their midst and had already destroyed one of their number, perhaps their leader. He must be destroyed. Bentley fought like a man possessed. His arms were gory with crimson from the slashing fangs of his enemies. His mouth was dripping with red foam as he slashed in turn with deadly accuracy. A great arm clutched at the hair of his chest and fell away again broken in two places, as Bentley snapped it like a pipe stem, because he knew leverages and was able to force his ape's body to obey the will of his human mind. One ape whimpering, rolling away to lick at his wounds, whimpered oddly like a baby that had burned its fingers. A great ape, weighing hundreds of pounds, crying like a child. Yet that child, with his arm unbroken, could have taken a grown man, no matter how much of a giant, and torn him to pieces. Two other apes were out of the fray, one dead, the other with only empty eye sockets where his red-rimmed eyes had been. 
Bentley guessed that Ape-Man had gone at least a mile into the jungle, heading directly away from the dwelling of Caleb Barter. He must get free and pursue. There was nothing else he could do. If he were slain, Ellen was doomed to a fate he dared not contemplate. Ape-Man would never be accepted by the apes, because to all outward seeming he was a man. His body would never stand the hardship of the jungle, yet Ape-Man would never guess that and would be slain. Bentley must prevent that. He must make sure that Ape-Man's body at least remains sufficiently healthy that it could become his own again, without the necessity of a long sojourn in some hospital. Ellen must not be left alone with Ape-Man, who was still an ape, running away with a she. A ghastly muddle. Now the apes broke away from Bentley. They broke in all direction into the jungle. Some of them seemed on the trail of Ape-Man. One of them took to the trees, swinging himself along with the speed of a running man, flying from limb to limb with no support save his hands. Bentley stared after the fleeing ape and then gave chase. He felt that the ape was on the trail of Ape-Man. Bentley did not know that he himself could follow the spore of Ape-Man, for he had not yet analyzed all of his new capabilities. But while he was discovering, he could follow something he could see, the fleeing ape, who would overhaul Ape-Man as though Ape-Man were standing still. So, in a manner of speaking, Bentley essayed his wings. He took to the trees after the fleeing ape, and was amazed that his great arms worked with ease, that he swung from limb to limb as easily and as surely as the other apes. He climbed to the upper terrace, where view of the ground was entirely shut off. His eyes took note of limbs capable of bearing his weight, after he had made one mistake that might easily have proved costly. He had leaped to a limb that would have supported Bentley of the Bengal Queen, but that was a mere twig under the weight of man-ape. It broke, and he fell, clutching for support, and fate was kind to him in that he found it, and so clambered back and swung easily and swiftly along. In his nostrils at intervals was a peculiar odor, a peculiarly human odor, reminding him of the work sweat of a man who seldom bathed. He knew that for the odor of ape-man, and a thrill of exultation encompassed him as he realized that he was following a spore by the cunning of his nostrils. There was a great leap across space. The ape ahead of him made it with ease. Bentley essayed it without hesitation, hurling himself into space, all of a hundred feet above the ground, with all the might of his arms, and almost overshot the mark, almost went crashing once more through the branches. But the tree swayed and held, and Bentley went swinging on. It was wildly exhilarating, thrilling in a primitive way. Bentley remembered those dreams of his childhood, dreams of falling endlessly but never striking. Racial memories, scientists called them, relics of our simian forebears. Bentley thought of that and laughed, but his laughter was merely a beastly chattering which recalled him to the grim necessity of the moment. Fifteen minutes passed, perhaps, twenty, half an hour. He was following a trace which led away from the coast and further away from the cabin of Caleb Barter, but with his jungle senses and his human memory, Bentley was sure he could return when the time came. Had Barter foreseen all that? Was Barter smiling to himself, back there in his awful hermitage, waiting for the working out of his experiment? But Ape-Man had jungle knowledge, and must have forced Bentley's body to the limit of its endurance, for it was near evening when Bentley, who had lost the ape ahead of him, but had continued on the spore of Ape-Man by the smell, came to swift pause on his race through the trees. He had heard the voice of Ellen Estabrook, and the voice was pleading, Lee, Lee, if you love me, try to regain control of yourself. Please do not stare at me like that. Oh, your poor body, the brush and briars have literally torn you to bits. But the answer of Lee was a bestial snarl, and traveling as quietly as he could, Manape dropped down so that he could gaze upon his beloved and the thing she believed she loved. Ellen was unaware of him, but he had scarcely dropped into view before Ape-Man became aware of him, and rose weakly to tottering limbs to beat his bruised and bleeding chest in simian challenge. 
Ape Man was simply an ape that had run until he was finished, and now was turning to make a last stand against a male who was stronger, a last bid for life and possession of the she he had carried away. Then Ellen saw Man-Ape, screamed, and for the first time since she had been saved from the deep by Bentley, fainted dead away. The two so strangely related creatures faced each other across her supine body, and both were savagely snarling. Ape Man weakly, but angrily, Man-Ape with a sound of such brute savagery that even the twittering of birds died away to awed silence. Chapter 8 Struggle for Mastery It was Ape Man who charged. Pity for Ape Man welled up in Bentley. That was his own body which Ape Man was so illy using. His own poor, bruised and bleeding body which Ape Man had all but slain by forcing it far beyond human endurance. It must be saved, in spite of Ape Man. But there was something first to do. Bentley bent over Ellen, caught her under his arm, and returned to the trees, with Ape Man chattering angrily and futilely behind him. Bentley found a crotch in the tree where he could place Ellen, made sure that she was safely propped there and that no snakes were near, and hurried back to the contest with Ape Man, which could not be avoided. He did not fear the battle he knew he must fight. He hurried back, because Ape Man might realize himself beaten and escape into the jungle. In his weakened condition, he could not travel far, and would be easy prey for any prowling leopard, easy prey for the crawling things whose fangs held sure death. Or would the cunning of Ape Man, denizen of the jungle, warn him against any such? His ape brain would warn him, but would his human strength avail in case of necessity, in case of attack by another ape or four-footed carnivore? Bentley hurried back, because Ape Man must be saved, somehow, even against his will. Ape Man hated Man-Ape with a deadly hatred. Yet to subdue the travesty of a human being, Man-Ape must take care that he did not destroy his own casement of humanity. Any moment now, and a great cat might charge from the shadows and destroy Ape Man. Ape Man, snarling, beat his puny chest with his puny hands, was waiting for Man-Ape, his enemy. Man-Ape found himself thinking of the line, O oh, wad some power the gifty gie us, to see ourselves as others see us, and adding some thoughts of his own, if that were actually, I, down there, my chance of preserving the life of myself and that of Ellen against the rigors of the jungle would be absolutely nil. How helpless we humans are in primitive surroundings. The tiniest serpent may slay us. The jungle cats destroy us with ease, if we be not equipped with artificial weapons which our better brains have created. As man-ape, barter's trained ape, I am better fitted to protect Ellen than if I were Bentley, the Bentley of the Bengal Queen. Yet she will cower away from me when she wakens. Now Bentley was down, and Ape Man was charging. He charged at a staggering run. He stepped on a thorn, hesitated, and whimpered. But he possessed unusual courage, for he still came on. Ape Man knew the law of the jungle, that the weakest must die. Death was to be his portion if he could not withstand the assaults of Man-Ape and he came to meet his fate with high, brute courage. Ape Man was close in. His hands were swinging, fists closed, in a strange travesty of a fighting man. Ape Man was snarling. He groped for the throat of Man-Ape with his human teeth, which sank home in the tough hide of Man-Ape, hurting him as little as though Ape Man were toothless. As Bentley, I would have had no chance at all against a great ape, said Bentley to himself. How could he take the pugnacity out of Ape Man without destroying him? If he struck him, he might strike too hard and slay Ape Man, which was the equivalent of slaying himself. So Man-Ape extended his mighty hands, caught Ape Man under the armpits and held him up, feet swinging free. Yet Ape Man still struggled, gnashed his teeth, and beat himself on the chest. How utterly futile! As futile as Bentley in his own casement would have been against a great ape. 
Apeman might destroy himself through his very rage. How could Bentley render the travesty unconscious, and yet make sure that Apeman did not die? If he struck, he might strike too hard and slay. What should he do? A low coughing sound came from somewhere close by. From the deeps of his consciousness, Bentley knew that sound. He clutched Apeman in his right arm, swung back to the tree and up among the branches. He was just in time. The tawny form of a great cat passed beneath, missing him by inches. But while he had saved himself and Apeman, he had been clumsy. He had struck the head of Apeman against the bowl of the tree, and Apeman hung limp in his arm. Bentley, fear such as he had never before known gripping him, pressed his huge ear to Apeman's heart. It was beating steadily and strongly. With a great inner sigh of relief, he climbed to safety in the tree, bearing Apeman with him. He reached the crotch where Ellen rested, and disposed Apeman nearby, his own gross body between them. He even dared to gather Ellen closer against him for warmth. His left hand held tightly the wrist of the unconscious ape-man, so that he should not fall and become prey to the night denizens of the jungle. So, the two who seemed to be human, ape-man and Ellen, passed from unconsciousness into natural sleep, while Bentley man-ape remained motionless between them, afraid to close his eyes, lest something even more terrible than hitherto experienced might transpire. But his ears caught every sound of the jungle, and his sensitive ape's nostrils brought him every scent, which his man's mind strove to analyze, reaching back and back into the dim and misty past for identification of odors that were new, or that were really old, yet which had been lost to man since they had left forever the simian homes of their ancestors, and their senses had become more highly specialized. The questions which turned over and over in Bentley's mind were these. How shall I tell Ellen the truth? Will she believe it? What is the rest of Barter's experiment? How shall I proceed from this moment on? How shall I procure food for Ellen? What food will ape-man choose for my body to assimilate? And jungle night drew on. Once Ellen shivered, and pressed closer to Manape as she slept. What would morning bring to this strange trio? End of section six.